Today's episode is sponsored by DL Chemical. They sell a range of polybutenes as well as ethylene propylene copolymers, which are called D-polybutene and d -cinol. Now, I'm actually more familiar with the d range where I've used DS600 and DS1100 in a range of industrial gear oils. I've actually been really impressed by uh, how well they incorporate into PAO fluids, especially considering how thick they are. But they've also got really high viscosity index, which can contribute a lot to your formulation. And overall, I've been really impressed with their oxidation stability in service as well. Considering how large the molecule is, they seem to be really shear stable. So if you're looking for an alternate to a very heavy PAO, give them a try. G'day everyone, welcome to Lubrication Experts. And today I have a very special guest. It's uh, Lisa Williams from Amatech Spectro Scientific. I'm giving the full name because I believe Amatech kind of took over the Spectro business a little while ago. But if you've been in the oil analysis game and maybe have some instruments, you're probably more likely uh, familiar with the Spectro Scientific brand. Um, obviously, they sell a, a whole range of different equipment. Um, Lisa has um, an incredible amount of experience in oil analysis kind of across the board, which is um, one of the reasons that I really wanted to have her on the podcast. Um, so Lisa has a background like in laboratory testing, um, has previously worked at MRG Labs with our friend Rich Wurzbach, who was actually the first guest on this podcast, was nice. episode number one, mm -hmm. um, and uh, also has a, a background in kind of field testing and field analysis, which I think is a really interesting area for us to explore. Um, we were talking a little bit before this, and basically I feel like, you know, uh, field testing in the sense of, you know, crackle test, patch test, um, that kind of stuff is very well understood and well defined. And then you've got the kind of third party lab testing where you send your uh, grease or oil samples off for analysis. I feel like everyone is very familiar with that kind of thing. And then there's this sort of gray area in between where there is field testing, um, but with maybe more, let's say, sophisticated equipment. You know, it's kind of like a, a very small version of what you would find in a third party lab. And I think that there's huge value in doing that, especially in larger industrial organizations. Um, but how do you make decisions around when that's appropriate for you? What kind of equipment should you be buying? How do you set up your field testing program? All of that is something that I hope, I'm hoping that we can cover today. Um, Lisa brings a wealth of experience. Uh, not only has she got the background on the commercial side, um, but she's also the chair of the in-service lubricant testing group with ASTM as well. So, um, you know, credentials galore here. Uh, so Lisa, thanks for joining us on the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this is going to be, uh, this is going to be really good. Um, and what's interesting is that despite the fact that we are more than 50 episodes in at this point, um, amazingly, we've only really done one, maybe two episodes on oil analysis. Um, so, which is, which is wild considering how important oil analysis is. So, uh, this will be, this will be a really important one for, for all our listeners. So, yeah, I'm excited to share a little bit more about oil analysis and, uh, on site and, uh, in testing, um, in a laboratory. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm really excited. So, Maybe we start with the kind of like the obvious question. Um, when when should uh, some kind of site or, um, you know, we, I'm mostly focusing here on industrial, maybe some really, really large fleets. When, when do you think that they should be considering a field testing program versus the standard, I send my results off to the lab? So, you know, and, and what are some of the kind of benefits of bringing your testing program uh, on site? Yeah, I think I think it's a really good place to start as far as just kind of understanding overall uh, where you are at as a as an organization that values or oil analysis as kind of like a, a value add to your business or whether or not it's kind of just like, a all right, well, it's a checklist item. We have to get this done and you know I'm checking it off kind of sort of looking at the data um, and but not really. So I think you first kind of have to decide like how serious are we as an organization about um, oil analysis and um, so when you when you have that backing of, of the organization to say okay you know we're going to go ahead and we're going to pursue this and and uh, then you can kind of go a few different ways so and that's when it kind of diverges to okay 
do we want to go and and work with a third party lab or do we want to go and and try to do this on our own and kind of set up a series of tests that allow us to evaluate our, our oils uh, on site. So I think that making that decision of kind of where to diverge to really comes down to uh, the sample volume um, and and manpower. And then obviously I probably should have said first and foremost cost and, and what kind of, of costs you have, uh, what kind of budgets you have available. Um, so first, I guess, let me start with cost because that's, that's really first and foremost with um, uh, on our minds really every day. But so cost is, really just more more of a, a discussion of just like, okay, this sample is going to cost me $8 to run on site, and this sample is going to cost me $25 to ship to a third-party lab. It's more than that um, because you have um, typically when you're purchasing equipment, it's coming out of different buckets of money. When you're purchasing on-site equipment, it's probably coming out of like a capital budget, um, versus you're just spending $25 monthly or quarterly times whatever number of samples you're doing and sending those out to a, a lab. So it's probably two different buckets of money that you're, you're dealing with from, fo- from a finance perspective. So I think that's the first question that you really need to, to discover and, and see if um, that bucket of money is, is available to you and, and where it is. Um, but that really the second thing to think about also is sample volume. And I don't mean like how much can I fill the sample bottle? I mean like number of samples that you're mm-hmm. running. So you don't really, I don't want to really like put a number on, on it uh, as far as like, okay, if I'm running seven samples a month, does it make better sense to ship it to a, a third party lab versus run that on site? Because that that then kind of diverges to another point of, well, those seven samples, I may need to know um, immediately what those results are so that I can make decisions and not shut my plant down. Or uh, that emergency diesel generator, is, it has to be running um, if something would happen. So I have to have those results immediately. You know, things like that should play into that overall um, decision as, as to whether or not uh, you have have the freedom of sending samples to a lab and waiting, um, or you need to have that result immediately. So volume of samples needs to be thought about uh, as well. And uh, I think if you can kind of take that, those two things as a whole and put them together, it makes sense over, it may make sense overall to bring things on site, but then it may make sense to to keep it either keep with a third party lab or establish a relationship with a third party lab. Yeah, that's really interesting. And um, obviously, the like the cost thing, um, you know, you know, it's it's a reasonably complex calculation because not only did you say that you know the money is coming out of uh, different buckets, um, but obviously, anytime mm-hmm. we're talking about oil analysis, we're also ki- considering sort of like the opportunity cost and and what's the cost of downtime. You know, if you can if you can pick up a right. failure. Um, a little bit earlier, um, you know, what what does that mm-hmm. do for your machine reliability? And and typically, you know, a failure on site is going to vastly outweigh the cost of, um, you know, capital equipment that you have to yes. put in for for yeah. developing kind of an oil analysis program. Um, I think for me, yeah. at least, you know, I always think we're kind of in a um, interesting industry of we have to justify our costs that hopefully don't happen, yeah. right? Um, I, I mean, as a maintenance industry, we have to um, make sure that there are no catastrophic failures. I mean, that's the ultimate goal, obviously. But we have to ask for money to make sure that a catastrophic failure doesn't happen, God forbid. And that's such a challenging place to be in, um, especially in this day and age with management wanting to see proof uh, before issuing money. Um, it, it's just, it's a hard business case, but it definitely can be done. Yeah. And then there's intangibles too, right? So I find with a couple of my clients that um, the fact that they have an on site oil analysis lab actually encourages more regular analysis. So mm-hmm. you know, that, that's one of the benefits that I see. And that's not really something that you can quantify and sort of like take to management um, as a, oh, we wouldn't right. do this otherwise, but but if we had the equipment, we'll test more frequently. But what I have found is that 
you know, often if, you, if you're paying, you know, whatever it is, 25 up to $40 for a, for a sample, yeah. depending on what region of the world you're in, sometimes there's a reluctance to test, uh, you know, where it's a gearbox or hydraulic system more frequently. But when you have the equipment on site, you think, oh, I can just, you know, take a sample and get it tested now. Yeah. And, and maybe you do it on a bit more of a uh, regular interval. And I at least find that the downstream benefits of that you know, being able to do a lot more trending, for example, um, and having um, a lot more data density to work with when you're trying to, you know, mm-hmm. make predictions. Um, that's, for, for me, one of the benefits, um, even if the results that you get out of them compared to, um, you know, a third party uh, setup might not be quite as extensive uh, in some mm-hmm. cases, obviously, depending on what equipment you end up purchasing. But yeah, that's, that's right. uh, one of the, the downstream benefits. So, then Absolutely. I think um, one thing that would be also helpful to, to understand is maybe uh, like typical industries, um, which would be well suited to kind of field mm-hmm. field analysis. And like within those industries, you know, how do you use a combination of maybe like the ASTM standards and maybe some mm-hmm. FMEA to figure out right. um, which are the which are the components in my my fleet or my plant um should i be testing and and kind of like on what interval should i be monitoring them yeah absolutely and i think that might be one of the hardest things to um to overcome and i think that we can tend to overthink it uh and so when i uh when i think about this process of really like test selection and uh, what we're going to monitor and how frequently we're going to monitor it. The ultimate way to do it, if we had full freedom, would be to run kind of a sampling study um, to figure out, okay, well, uh, let's use a car, for example. You know, every everybody drives a vehicle and we nowadays saying up to eight to 10,000 miles between an oil change. I mean, even with our vehicles, we're still not really at that condition based, based strategy yet, but you know, is it appropriate even I have, and I haven't even done this with my own vehicle and I've got one site equipment sitting, sitting next to me that I could use, but at 8,000 miles, is it really necessary that I change the oil? Um, and is my oil oxidized? Is the, how's the viscosity doing? How are my antioxidants doing? How are my wear levels? You know, I, I haven't, that, those are things that you, you would typically want to ask yourself before going ahead and, and changing uh, the oil. And for, if we were able to conduct like a small sampling study where we picked a couple components, let's just use gearboxes, for example, um, and we were able to monitor them over the course of, of a few months and figure out, okay, you know, quarterly does work for us. Uh, and that would be kind of the, the ultimate way to do it is to have data to drive that decision mm-hmm. and say, okay, um, the, the, the wear particle analysis that we did on it is telling us some really good things at, on a quarterly basis. And so we'll run wear, wear analysis and we'll do this quarterly and make assessment that way. I think the um, from a from a FMEA process, uh, failure modes and effects analysis. I think that probably is the reality of where most of us are. Is like something failed. Now we're going to test it, which is okay. I mean, it is okay. Obviously, we want to eliminate failures one hundred percent, and and that would be a, a perfect world. But we don't live in a perfect world. Um, but anytime a, a failure happens, we don't just want to go in and replace a bearing, replace a gearbox and move on. I mean, we want to take the time and figure out why that happened. Um, and I think another interesting point that I've learned is I, I, when I first started out in the industry, I thought, well, it's probably always oil related. It's not always oil related. So taking that time to do FMEA to learn that it's not oil related may actually help you realize that oil analysis may not help in this situation. Um, so I think that's another valuable lesson, but, um, in general, uh, there is, there are some guidelines for out there. So like when you're not, um, when you're not familiar with this and Hey, somebody comes in and they're like, Hey, you're going to be responsible for, uh, running the oil program. And let's be honest. I mean, that's happening now, now more, more than ever. And, and people are like, uh, 
okay, yeah. <laughs> what does that even mean? <laughs> you know, like um, I went to school for engineering and you're talking about this thing called tribology and oil analysis. And I didn't take a single class on yeah. that. So what now? And I mean, at least that's how it was, was for me. And um, you, know, you, you start to, to kind of poke around and see what books are out there to help you make these kind of decisions. And um, I did pull a couple things out from my library. Um, but this is an ICML document. Um, this is ICML 55.1, um, but ICML 55.2 just came out. And there's an entire section in there that talks about setting up a lab, whether that be and helping you make a decision about whether or not um, going to a third party lab, going in like a hybrid function of how maybe we're going to do a little bit of on site screening testing um, and use a third party lab. Um, or we want to bring it completely on site. So it talks about that. But not only does it talk about that, it talks about the very beginning, like your initial question of like, we need to pick out what equipment we're going to monitor and how do we do that? And it talks about not, not making it too complicated. And then it, it describes what test slate is recommended for gearboxes, hydraulic systems, um, turbines, and uh, it gives some recommended tests. And, and then it gives some recommendations to think about on determining sampling frequency. I would say in general, just a general rule of thumb, if everything that I just said completely overwhelmed you, um, to just go on a quarterly sampling frequency and start there. Um, I think that's probably the, the easiest thing to do. And then start to look at the data. And if the, the data is, is um, kind of just trending like this, and it's not really changing too much, you may be sampling uh, or you may be testing too frequently. So Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting and, and great tip to, uh, to, to check out the, uh, the ICML documentation. So um, I'm one of those heathens that no longer reads physical books and I only do e-books. Right? I mean, it's, it's hard to read a, a book anymore. Yeah. yeah. So I've got the PDF copy, mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, that works which too. is which is fantastic, right? Uh, so I think, you know, ICML 55.2 is kind of like a missing piece of the puzzle. And we did cover this uh, previously. Um, we did an entire podcast on 55.2. So um, I'll link that in the description if anyone wants to check it out. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yes, you, you yeah, did. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, but, but I think the, the great thing about 55.2, uh, I think that last, last podcast came out just as 55.2 was being released. And I've actually had the opportunity mm -hmm. to read it now. And the great thing about it is that it's very um, actionable. All right, so 55.1 kind of sets up a framework and helps your business right. kind of think about how oil analysis and how lubricants relate to asset management. But 55.2 is much more, here is how you go about it um, with you know actual steps. Um, and I should give, quickly give exactly. a, a plug to Lisa because she did actually write the 55.2 section specifically on, uh, on on field analysis and how you make these decisions. Um, and it's and it's very well laid out, right? Um, so yeah. uh, for anyone who is so, looking to develop a program, go there. This, uh, this 60 minutes that we have, the section seven of ICML 55.2, I think came out to be about 42 pages. So of, uh, of fun. And, uh, but really the, uh, being able to summarize all that in 60 minutes is going to be hard, but they're, they're 42 pages of basically recommending going, how to go through this process of, uh, failure modes and effects analysis, selecting the right equipment to test what, what would be appropriate to test, um, setting sampling frequency and choosing your test slate. Um, so I think it's, it's just a really good reference for people who, you know, got kind of put into this job of managing an on-site lab or, or even managing uh, third-party data um, and, and understanding what to do. Yeah, and, and especially because, you know, when you, when you first get thrown into something like this and, you, and you're asked about, uh, you know, whether it's third-party testing or field testing, uh, up until this point, really the only kind of major reference was to go to the actual ASTM standards, right? Um, right. Which are um, obviously very good and very detailed, Mm -hmm. But at the field level, it's probably overkill. Um, not only that, but you also don't have access to them. Like you've got to purchase each one individually, um, unless your yeah. organization is kind of like a, you know, member of something that has access to all the ASTM right. uh, uh, papers. So, 
that in itself is can be quite a difficult task. But when it's all this kind of distilled down into this one document, mm-hmm. um, it makes it makes it so much easier. And uh, so, so maybe something I'd, I'd, I would be interested in getting your opinion on is when it comes to field testing. Uh, this is just a framework that I've used to sort of make decisions, and this was before I had access to fifty five point two. Was that in in some instances mm-hmm. I've kind of guided a few of my customers to say, well, you know, obviously. Um, you, there's basically infinite combinations of equipment that you could buy for your site. Right. And obviously that comes with cost, right? So, uh, and some pieces of equipment are way more expensive than others. So, uh, you know, I got a bit of sticky shock when I first saw prices come through for ICP specifically. <laughs> that one gave me a heart yeah. attack. Others, you know, yes. a viscometer or, mm-hmm. or, or something like that can, can be relatively inexpensive, right? For um, what right. Get. So, you know, obviously, no one has unlimited budget. Um, and so the way that I've kind of thought about it is, you know, maybe you want to use field analysis for kind of leading indicators and third-party mm-hmm. analysis for lagging indicators. So, you mm-hmm. know, as an example, you know, with turbine or condition monitoring, um, you know, if you're looking at lubricant and lubricant breakdown, maybe something that you want to mm-hmm. be able to test on site is acid number, you know, in the case of polyol mm-hmm. esters, or you might want to be able to test, let's say, for example, MPC, um, if you're, you know, concerned about varnish buildup, which these days everyone seems to be. Um, right. And and lagging indicators, which would be things like wear metals and ICP, um, you can do that on mm-hmm. a regular basis uh, kind of at the lab. Um, is, is that a, a reasonable framework to use or would you look at it a different way? No, I think that is a, a reasonable way to look at it. I think things uh, on-site testing can, like you say, can range from uh, spec- uh, having a spectrometer, a metal spectrometer on-site um, to something as simple as as a viscometer uh, on-site and, and screening samples that way. Uh, varnish, of course, is something. Um, the ruler test is another one. Um, and moisture, all of those could be monitored um, on site, um, for specifically in, in turbine applications. And if something would be seen to kind of go, go awry, as far as that trending goes, we could then outsource that sample to a, a third party lab. I think um, as far as price range goes, of course, depending on how much you spend to kind of go to the Cadillac version of, Hey, you know, I'm all in, I'm going to spend, um, 200 K on getting a spectrometer and a viscometer and getting, a uh, um, you know, chemistry, uh, kind of integrity monitoring device varnish. You, know, you could, you could just go, go crazy and, and, uh, end up spending a lot of money. I think that there is a, a balance that you can uh, achieve in developing like a screening program to um, say, okay, we're going to run these five tests on site. If any of them flag, uh, we're, we're going to then outsource that sample. Uh, and I think that's a way, uh, especially if you're new to uh, oil analysis just in general, and it's something that you want to get more involved with as an organization it's a way to have some control over um, your data. And um, it's a way to then also establish a relationship with a third party lab that can help you manage the uh, manage the data too. Um, Cause I think that's, that's another part of this is when you're bringing, when you're doing testing on site um, we have to know what we're looking at. So that, that's kind of a whole, a whole other, other part of this that I'm sure we'll get into later, but um, you have to know what you're looking at when you're running these on-site tests. But I, the only one, only yeah, thing that- I would change as far as leading to lagging indicator theory that you propose, I like it, except I would add in viscosity, even though that's a lagging indicator test. I think you can tell a lot about just running viscosity on-site. Um, I, it can be a, a world of, of things. I think viscosity you know, it can be oxidation, it can be fuel dilution, can be moisture, it can be lubricant mixing. I think it can be a world of things, but I think changes in viscosity dictate a lot. Um, so just a simple viscosity test on site um, may be able to, to really um, 
help us solve some things. Uh, yeah, and and uh, uh, that's obviously like a, a lot a lot for everyone to think about. But but uh, I should say from the outset as well, um, you know, with the with the ICP stuff, like yes, the equipment can be expensive, but absolutely justified in in a lot of instances. So um, you know, some of the yes. bigger mining customers, mm-hmm. for example, that are doing hundreds and hundreds of samples on on many assets uh for them it makes absolute sense right to have uh, an icp unit on site because you can pretty easily justify the cost um reasonably quickly especially if you're able to pull the money from a from a capital budget so it is you know highly dependent on uh the kind of industry you're in the 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 size of the site that you're on and and uh and all things like that but um definitely some some really good tips in there from from you lisa um one thing that i've actually uh, heard you talk a little bit about as well is using a uh, field uh, test station uh, to be able to test new oils. Um, so stuff that mm-hmm. you know we're not talking about used oil analysis testing now. Now we're talking about new oil analysis testing. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's probably something that I haven't really seen really anyone do, except in the case of. Um, yeah maybe deliveries right so you're you know you've your yeah. uh uh your oil supplier is is delivering you twenty thousand liters of hydraulic oil and you have specified a cleanliness standard um and mm-hmm. and partially this is driven by the oems right because the likes of caterpillar uh, give you specifications on uh, engine oil as well as hydraulic oil cleanliness um now mm-hmm. the downfall that i see personally is that people test um at delivery so they test you know, basically, what's coming out of the tanker, um, and then they 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 shovel that into a, a dirty storage tank and completely ruin their particle. Yeah. Um, you, you talk a little bit more broadly about testing new oils when they're in storage. Um, what do you see as being the advantages yes. of, of doing that, and how does it impact kind of reliability down the line? Yeah. So. The first thing that comes to mind, and I'll, I'll just tell this quick story because I it sticks in my mind so vividly, is uh, when I was I I've, I've been working in a lab environment or with lab equipment now seventeen years. So probably my first year on the job, I was working in in a lab at MRG, and we were doing some testing on some greases, and uh, we were running a ruler test on uh, a grease. And for, for those of you that, that are not familiar with the ruler test, you must have a brand new sample of oil or grease um, in order to compare it to the in-service sample. And so we went ahead and we run this test and um, we were getting uh, a zero antioxidant response from, from the grease. And we were getting... Um, an antioxidant response from the in-service sample wasn't a big response, but it was a response. I thought, hmm, that's really weird. Let's go ahead. Let's run it again. So we ran it, you know, three times and uh, still getting this kind of flat line of, of antioxidant from, from the new grease. Well, come to find out, um, there was no, there were no additives that had been added to this, this particular batch of grease. And that kind of led to a whole other discussion of, of quality issues uh, with with this particular batch of grease. Uh, so my, my point being with this story is as far as, as uh, quality management goes, antioxidants are just something very important to to monitor in a, a new oil or, or a new grease. Um, over time, whether you're using it or not, it's going to deplete. Um, so in loop storage, we really should practice good inventory, have good inventory practices where we're rotating and uh, utilizing the, um, uh, the the lubricant quickly so that the antioxidants are, are not depleting at a, a rapid rate. Um, and then we put in a antiox- or antioxidant-free uh, oil or antioxidant-free grease. Like I'm, that is what happened when we were running this test. So uh, that would be one reason why it would be important to do uh, testing and to, to just make sure that our inventory practices are good um, from a loop storage standpoint. Um, but you brought up a really good point about uh, just quality control in general when oils and greases are being delivered, but oil more 
more in particular is it's just as far as when oil gets delivered, the assumption that oil is clean, I think is made a lot. Um, so we, we really do need to take care of that idea of and, and get some data behind that idea of, you know, oil isn't always clean upon delivery. Um, and being able to do that initial on-site testing um, is, is pretty important to make sure that we're, we're receiving either receiving clean oil or we're making the determination that we need to clean it up before we put it in the equipment. Yeah, definitely. I mean, so the way I always kind of describe it to my customers is that, uh, you know, the, there is a good reason why oil is not clean to begin with, right? Uh, um, basically, you know, think about it from the oil company's perspective. If you're making hydraulic oil, um, you know, that hydraulic oil is potentially going to a range of different customers. Um, so some of them might be of in plastic injection molding where oil mm -hmm. cleanliness is extremely important, yeah. right? And, you mm -hmm. know, if you have dirty oil, then potentially it runs you into issues down the line with you know, valve sticking and all sorts of stuff, right? Versus you've got someone who is, I don't know, in, uh, you know, something I see a lot, you know, country New South Wales, you know, quarries uh, who... Right. Um, let's say I'm not so great with, uh, uh, let's say hose integrity, let's call it. <laughs> yeah, Basically true. they're spraying hydraulic oil all mm -hmm. over the place. And, um, you know, <laughs> for them, it is cleanliness matter. No, not really. So, you know, from an oil company's perspective, if they were going to make everything to a cleanliness standard, like which customer do they make it for? So the idea is that they just right. make hydraulic oil, um, and, you know, it's really up to the end user to clean it up to the specification that they need mm -hmm. because obviously, you know, any cleaning that is done at the manufacturing plant, that's time and money, which would end up being added to the dollar per liter cost, right? Now, there are, um, you know, I can think of, a, you know, a good example would be Chevron's ISO clean program um, where uh, there are, you know, companies that will certify you know, lubricants to a cleanliness standard, but generally you do pay a little bit extra for that, right? Because there is a little mm -hmm. bit more time right. and cost associated with cleaning it up. So, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, there's just something to be aware of. Uh, yeah, like you said, oil does not turn up, uh, you know, in a clean state. And if you want it clean right. to a specific cleanliness level, well, that's kind of on you. Um, so that, that's right. that's a that's definitely a good point. Um, and well, and you bring up a good point too about just. You know, we won't throw uh, oil formulators and, and manufacturers under the bus here. I mean, they have to do one size fits all, and that's where they are. And it is up to us, the end user, to say, okay, well, 17, 15, 13 is my code. I'm not there yet. I got a filter. So, yeah. Very good point. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, often, often if that's not kind of in your wheelhouse, uh, there are definitely. Uh, you know, providers, you know, I know that there are a handful oh, of providers yes. in Australia as well as in, in the US who kind of do this on, on contract, right? So if you do need a specialist, right. uh, I can encourage you to sort of reach out to one of those. Um, okay, so right. now we've, we've kind of talked through um, how you might go about uh, setting up, you know, an on-site lab, the circumstances in which you might mm -hmm. do it, um, you know, the fact that you probably not just testing uh used lubricants but also potentially uh new oils as well um uh, now we kind of sort of to the personnel part right so you, you need someone to actually do sure. the testing and like you right. said in a lot of circumstances it's literally just you know someone points at you and says you mm -hmm. you are going to be the, the, the oil testing person yes. and, and you kind of like yes. look around and hope that they weren't pointing at you and they were pointing at someone behind you right so Let's say, for example, I'm completely green and I have mm -hmm. no familiarity with oil oil analysis and I think, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. like, where do I go from here? I probably need right. to learn about oil analysis somewhere and it would be right. good if the, the, the training that was offered was kind of more tailored to sort of that sort of field testing. So are there any certification programs you know does does the likes of uh what icml's like lla or stle's oma mm -hmm. programs do they cover um field right. testing that, that's like this so you know where would where would someone go so um i think that there are there are a lot of options there are a lot of different avenues that you could go 
Um, <clears throat> I'm going to first start out with my story because I was completely um, green with this when I started. So my background is in chemistry. Um, I did my senior thesis project on uh, converting um, eth I was lo looking at ethanol as a, as a fuel source and I was kind of in like a completely different space. And so I graduate from college and um, I, I land my first job and, and I'm a lab manager at an oil analysis lab. And I'm like, great, this is a great gig. And I had interned for them. Um, and I, uh, I had great organizational skills. I could hold my, hold my own when it came to a, a chemistry discussion or engineering discussion. But, um, there was this concept called tribology, uh, that I had never, never heard of. And, um, I, re I remember, uh, being put in a class, uh, and it was an ML, MLA one class. Um, and I took it. Uh, pretty early in my career. And um, it started getting me familiar with all of the different, um, all the different tests that a lab runs. Um, but it also familiarizes you with the machine part of it and machine care part of it. And I, I think that it's really important to have both of those pieces. Um, there, there's an LLA route, um, which is a laboratory lubricant analyst route, which strict, strictly talks about lubricant testing. Um, and uh, I, I like that class a lot. I've taught it. I've taken the exam. Um, but I think that that maybe is something that's a little bit more down the road once you have have some some a little bit more experience under your belt. Um, but what I would recommend is, is ICML's MLA1 or um, STLE's OOA1 um, or OMA, I said OOA, OMA1. And I think that that kind of gives you this introduction to the industry of oil analysis. Uh, it gives you a good balance between, hey, I'm, this is what's happening on site. This is how to care for a machine. And then also this is the testing that you can do to uh, monitor, condition monitor the, uh, the machine. So um, I would recommend that. And as you grow in the industry, I think getting very specialized testing on if you decide to purchase on-site equipment, um, you obviously then will want to get very instrument specific training. I know at Spectre Scientific where we do send out our field engineers for a few days to spend with the person who purchased the equipment. Um, and they'll go over the equipment and, and best practices and making sure that the data is good that's coming out of the out of the instrument and kind of help you with workflow. Um, so I think that where we can go wrong in, in it is say, hey, here's here's this one site project that we're going to give you um, and we give it to Mr. or Mrs. Engineer. And, but we don't give them any background as to why. And I feel like um, with any job, when we don't understand why we're doing it, what the value is, it doesn't lead to sustainment of a program. It doesn't lead to a passion of, of the program. And um, so I really think being able to start out with that MLA one class uh, and then kind of building into an instrument specific kind of instruction on site really leads to the kind of the best ultimate combination. And I will say also that, um, and I think we're all guilty of this as our jobs are getting more and more busy is try to get yourself off site. Um, you know, go to a, a, a different location that you're not sitting at your desk, taking these online classes, um, where people have access to you. Um, they're knocking on their door. Um, it, it really is the type of class. Um, it's a combination of engineering and chemistry and on site, uh, experience that these classes are, and they require your full attention. Um, they, these aren't easy topics. So by any sense of the means, and, and you should be proud of yourself that you're, you're in these classes and learning this stuff, um, but it does require some, some devotion. And of course, you know, if you want the certification, you have a test you have to take at the end of the week. So you wanna be able to listen and focus um, and, and be able to study throughout the week. So uh, that would be my recommendation, um, regardless of whether or not you are deciding to bring it on site or even starting a relationship with a third party lab, I think being able to have those discussions, even with your advisor at a third party lab, 
to help make decisions about how the state is going to help our plant is uh, it's very important. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, like I even offer online training and I still think it's no substitute for in person, right? Like I, you know, would much prefer if possible to, to be able to do that sort of in person training because right. like you said, you know, level of concentration, but also interaction is uh, there's, there's really no replacement for, uh, for, for in person. Um, and something I was thinking about when you were talking about that was, was, you know, if you, if you can get that training and that familiarity with the, uh, the tools that you have, um, and you know, kind of what oil analysis is. I actually think that uh, you know this kind of level of field analysis is, in many respects, the best way to overcome what I see as being probably the big weakness of third-party testing, which is the interpretation level. Um, you know, so everyone who's done third-party oil analysis will know that you know the the insights that you get. Um, it's kind of up to you to interpret. And sometimes the, the, the interpretation that you get is pretty generic. Um, now, that's not mm -hmm. the fault of the third-party labs. It's, it's that they're not on site, right? They, they, they don't know your equipment right. as intimately as you do. Um, and so the very nature of their, you know, basically algorithmic recommendations has to be reasonably high level. You know, for you at the right. field level, if you can get that understanding of both your equipment as well as the, the oil analysis side, then, you know, hopefully there's the kind of like the, the marriage of the best of both worlds uh, and you can get those results right. relatively quickly, but also uh, with, a, with a much deeper level of interpretation. So, um, and, you know, that's kind of like the holy grail of oil analysis, right? It is. It is. I mean, if you can bring together the engineering experience and combine that with the data and be able to make a decision off of that, I mean, that's really, um, that's dynamite. I mean, that's, that's gold right there. Um, and as you were talking, I'm thinking I've been on both ends of that. So um, as far as creating oil analysis reports for, for uh, a third party lab, if you want to make specific recommendations, you're on the phone with that engineer yeah. and you're having that discussion. Um, and it is just, it's not sustainable in a lot of cases and so you you kind of turn to these these more generic statements and then you are putting it up to the engineer to if they have questions they're calling you and you know scheduling a time to talk to you and 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 ask you what you've seen and does this make sense or why am i seeing this number high um and you know that's a lot of back and forth that i just feel like we had more time for that 15 years ago than we do now i i don't know it's it's um but i really do feel like that that amount of time has has changed um but i certainly did it i did it when i was was in the lab um but the on the other side of that um so at spectra scientific that's one thing that we really we really value is we really want and we have software designed for that is we really want the engineer on site to be dictating alarms, dictating things like um, uh, particle count levels that maybe we we are recommending one thing, but the the site needs needs something else, and um, or why something's wearing, and um, you know a certain metal level that is is up, and we may have no idea why that's wearing from at Spectra Scientific, but the engineer on site may have a perfect idea because that he understands, he or she understands that machine. Um, so I really think that that's where the power of oil analysis lies is when that engineer with the, the experience paired with understanding of the data is so powerful. And if you don't have any kind of real formalized training of understanding the power of oil data, and you just kind of know how the machine works or how it, how it, hear, how it smells or what it sounds like. And like, that's all data. I mean, even though we're, you know, just using our senses, that's all we can put data to that. And when you can put data with that, it really is, is very powerful. Yeah. Yeah. And, and actually if, if anyone is interested in like sort of how to set, how, well, how limits are set and how you might want to set your own, uh, a couple mm -hmm. of weeks ago we did a podcast with 
Elaine Hepley from Polaris Labs, um, and so I'll link that in the description as well because we we kind of cover that topic in a little bit of detail. So um, yeah, I mean that's it's great. That is excellent. I think that that having that information paired with getting a kind of a clump of data to work with to start with is is excellent. Yeah. Now, as we start to sort of get into the end of these podcasts, I always like to ask questions about what does the future look like. Um, yeah. Uh, so. Uh, maybe a, a question for you, which is a bit more kind of speculative. You know, you put your um, sure. put your tinfoil hat on, or look into crystal ball, or whatever it is. Um, what do you think the the future of um, of oil and well, we can broaden out to oil analysis, but also talk specifically about field analysis. Well, what do you think it it yeah. looks like? Do, is it the same tools, but they get more refined? Um, is it is it better tools that become available to us? Uh, how do you see it sort of playing out in maybe the next 10 years or so? Yeah, I I think that sensor technology is going to continue to evolve. Um, I, I think there's a lot of a lot of value with sensor technology in how it benefits the oil analysis industry, but I think we still have a little ways to go in in that development process. Um, but I think that it it will um significantly contribute to the next 10 years of, of uh, the oil analysis industry. Um, I think we really need to, as a industry, get things documented better. Um, and, and what I mean by that is uh, we have a lot of people out there that are really knowledgeable about just looking at um, data and knowing, just knowing from years of experience that something is wrong, something needs to be changed. And, and um, eventually those people are going to want to retire. And so I think we, we need to do a better job getting things documented, um, whether that be in a software format that we can use for years and years to come, or rather just be a work instruction on site. So I think it's really important to over these next 10 years to, to really make sure we get things documented from, from key people. Uh, I think that there will be, um, there will continue to be a need for third party labs. There will continue to be a need for uh, on site analysis. I think each will, will continue to have their, their own space. Um, I think that on site folks who are, are utilizing uh, on site technologies. Um, can continue to uh, pull off of the experience of, of what we have from our third party labs. I think there will continue to be, be relationships there. Um, and But I think we are, as an industry, um, go, leaning more towards um, figuring out how to automate things and make things easier on ourselves rather than, you know, typing up these reports, individual reports. So I think that this automation is really um, where, where we're headed uh, as an industry. But I think each of these pieces will continue to have their own space um, within the industry. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. And like you talk about, you know, obviously um, there's a lot of experience uh, that feels like it's on the verge of, of leaving. Um, uh you know that, and that's true across the board, right? It's it's true in industry, it's true in the oil analysis labs, uh, even true to a certain extent in the ASTM committees. <laughs> um, Correct. If anyone wants to get mm -hmm. involved, um, so uh, yes. mainly uh, anyone US based, right? So if there's anyone kind of that's US right. based that can make yeah. the ASTM committee meetings, uh, Lisa would love yes. to hear from you. <laughs> yes. That's right. So you don't have to be U.S. based, but all the meetings are U.S. based. So if you have trouble getting to the U.S., it's it is definitely easier to be U.S. based. Yes. Yeah. 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 So but we would welcome the expertise. We have um, we have like forty three standards in our within our committee jurisdiction, and you know, all of the labs that are um, running oil testing are utilizing these standards. And so we, we need technical expertise in these committees continuing to provide feedback of, hey, that's not right in the standard. That's, we should change that. Um, and uh, we, we, uh, we welcome new, new ideas and uh, new people for sure. So 
shameless plug for my company. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> awesome. Well, with that with that kind of uh, call to arms and that call to action, uh, Lisa, thanks so much for, for joining us today. I think you provided like a wealth of insight. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I hope hopefully there's some, some really good takeaways for people about, you know, when, where, how, uh, and why you should set up um, either a field lab or, or third party oil analysis. Like you said, you know, we want to get away from it being a tick the box exercise. You know, it's not a it's right. not a compliance thing. It's it's there to give you insights uh, and improve your reliability. So, now really really appreciate your time and um, yeah, we'll talk again soon. Absolutely, thank you.